reading to the scripture that Abigail read this morning in the Gospel of Matthew as we continue to study through that gospel. We're in Matthew chapter 26, and the Church Bibles, page 997, Matthew 26, and verse 47, the arrest of the Lord Jesus Christ. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. The subject today is betrayal. Jesus betrayed with a kiss. Matthew tells the story of what happened to Jesus in the whole of his gospel. Of course, the great overarching theme, the theme of this gospel is that Jesus is a king, and that he is called to be the king messiah of Israel and of all God's people and of all creation. But the king was conspired against, and the king was let down, and the king was betrayed. This is the greatest betrayal in recorded history. And it is so deceitful, because the kiss that should have been a sign of affection and love and intimacy and loyalty is the very signal that Judas has agreed with a mob, an arresting party, numbering hundreds, perhaps even a thousand, to kiss Jesus as a sign. This is the one you must seize. This is the one you must bind. This is the one you must beat. This is the one you must drag to a kangaroo court where he will not receive justice at all. What kind of man betrays his master with a kiss, looking him in the eye. It's incredible. We don't actually know a whole lot about the biography or the background or the motivation of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Some people think that his name means that he is the Ish Karaioth, the man from Karaioth, but even that is a best guess. So perhaps he came from uh, southern Judea rather than Galilee, where the other disciples came from. But even if that's the case, I don't think we should read too much into that. There's a mystery about what G Judas did. There is a darkness that steals into this man and into his choices and into his soul that is, quite honestly, supernatural and evil. Judas, we do know from the Gospels, was the treasurer for the band of disciples. He held the bag with the money that provided for Jesus and his followers, and they decided afterwards that he was a thief so we're not really speculating if we assume that greed and self-centeredness was part of what made this man tick. In fiction, in plays, in books, even on Broadway and in film, Judas has been portrayed. And in art, down through the centuries, Judas has been portrayed. And he's often portrayed as some kind of monster as some kind of ugly man or twisted man eh, with a face like an ape, simian features. Or in the Middle Ages, when there was great anti-Semitism abroad, especially in Europe, eh, he was painted as an archetypical Jew. Well, what race did Jesus belong to? What race did the other eleven disciples, apostles belonged to. They were all Jews. It wasn't that he was a Jew that made Judas a traitor to Jesus. It was that his soul was held in the darkness and the selfishness and the blackness of rebellion and unbelief and stubbornness. He walked away from the light of the world 
And John's gospel records that he left the upper room where the first Lord's Supper was conducted, where their feet had been washed by the Savior, and he went out, and John's gospel says, it was night! And out into the night Judas went, and his soul never came back from the night. He went into darkness, and the darkness closed over him. Soon he will be a despairing man, committing suicide. There's a difference between the, the rest of the apostolic band, the other disciples. They all failed Jesus. They all let Jesus down. But they were not traitors. They did not despise Jesus. They loved Jesus, and they failed him. And you need to encourage your heart when you fail that there is a difference between failing and slipping and sinning and grieving and sorrowing over that. There is a sorrow that is genuine and a sorrow that leads to repentance, and there is a sorrow that is selfish, that is frankly just wallowing in self-pity. Judas was wallowing. He hadn't really understood Jesus or his message or his mission. This wasn't the kind of Messiah he wanted. This wasn't the kind of salvation he wanted. And so for 30 pieces of silver, he would take what he could get. He would not humble himself. But we can learn from Judas. He is a warning to us. So was he a monster? In some ways, yes. In the sense that sin makes monsters of all of us. I want to observe two things today. First of all, a monstrous traitor, thinking about Judas, and then a monstrous betrayal, looking at what he did. A monstrous traitor. That's the first thing. So what does a traitor, what does an apostate, what does a traitor against the Son of God look like? Like an ape? No. Like a medieval painting of a, a twisted, cunning, greedy Jew? No. What does a traitor look like? Well, get a mirror. He looks like you or me or anyone you would meet in your family or on the street. He looked normal. No one suspected Judas in the upper room when Jesus announced, one of you will betray me. They looked at each other in amazement, and, and they began to question themselves. Nobody said, I think it's Judas. Nobody said, it must be Judas. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? They were quicker to doubt themselves than to doubt this man, Judas. The way the New Testament generally refers to Judas is the way Matthew here refers to in verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas appeared. And how is he described? Judas, one of the twelve. He fitted in. He belonged. He was on the inside of the early church. He was there. So what does a traitor look like? Like any of us. And that's a warning that any of us could let Jesus down really badly. In the past, there have been very fanciful depictions of Judas, as I said, in the Inferno. Dante pictures the devil and the demons of hell receiving Judas and biting his head off. But Judas, if you met him, would have looked perhaps every bit as respectable as a church-going elder or someone that you might be very happy to have in your home today. And that's why he's such a strong warning to us. What he did is unparalleled in history. He is the greatest, the biggest the most monstrous traitor in history. But remind your soul, 
but by the grace of God. I could have done that. But by the grace of God, I will end up betraying Jesus and putting myself in front of God's glory. Take care not to walk away from the gospel and the grace of God. Judas was privileged. He heard the Son of God. He saw the miracles. He heard the greatest preaching there has ever been. He was lost. He was not saved. We have all heard the gospel many times. Let Judas stand as a warning. A traitor looks just like the rest of us. Don't let that be you. Go to Jesus. Go today. But the second thing I want you to think about is that a traitor against Jesus is seldom alone. The conspiracy against Jesus was growing, and it was strong, and it numbered in the hundreds. All the powerful people were part of it, and Judas was simply choosing his side. He was choosing the side of the crowd. He was choosing the side of power. And it's much, much easier to betray the gospel, to betray the truth, to betray Jesus if you are in like-minded company. That's why it's so important, young people, when you leave home, to establish yourself in a good gospel church when you leave home, to be involved in the life of the church, to be involved in serving, to be involved in praying, to be involved in studying, to be involved in sharing the gospel with others. Because if we think, I'll be a Christian, but I don't need a church with me and around me, we will be in danger. The company that we keep may be pulling us away from Christ. And we need to think about that. Yes, we want to have friends that we're influencing and, and helping and winning for the Lord. We don't behave like monks or nuns. We live in this world. We are open to the people of this world. But we don't fit in and agree with and go along with the flow when it is anti-God. We don't go along with the flow when it is mocking God. We don't go along with the flow when it is damaging spiritually, when it is sinful. There are lines we do not cross. Judas chose a side. And I think when the gospel is preached, part of what the gospel is saying to us is, well, by the grace of God, we have to choose a side as well. And every time we push the, the message of Christ away, we are choosing a side, and we're choosing the wrong side. So this isn't for me, or it isn't for me just now. I'm too young, or I'm too busy, or work is too much, or whatever. Choose a side. Not to choose Jesus is to choose a side. Sin and selfishness finds comfort and boldness in numbers. That's how the bullies of history got away with it, or thought they got away with it, because they gather in numbers to attack the weak, to persecute God's church. So a crowd, an intimidating crowd arrive. They have clubs. Some of them have swords. They were probably professional soldiers, those who had the swords. We are told a little bit about them. They were sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people, but among them were Roman soldiers as well, stationed at that time in Fort Antonia and Jerusalem, uh, there were thousands of Roman soldiers, and a cohort of Roman soldiers would have numbered maybe 600. There were, we know from Luke 22, temple police there. There were Roman soldiers there, we know from John 18, verse 3. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were represented there. We know that from John 18, from Mark 15, and from the book of Acts, chapter 23. There were many stakeholders. The chief priests were represented. The elders, the whole Sanhedrin, were represented. How many? In the hundreds. 
some commentators say, maybe as many as a thousand. Do you think that's overkill? They're there to arrest one man whom they were afraid to arrest in public or during the day or in the temple courts, lest it spark off a riot because they knew Jesus had many friends, many admirers, many supporters. And so a crowd, a mob are gathered secretly and under cover of darkness to go to a lonely place outside the city, a place where they think no one will be expecting them. It's overkill. But that's the way the devil operates. He tries to overwhelm, and he tries to catch you off guard, and he tries to fight an unfair fight. It looks like a rebel is being taken. But this traitor Judas leading a mob, he's not in charge. Who held all the power that night? as the mob come with swords and clubs. When Jesus identifies himself, they fall on the ground. When one of uh, Jesus' followers, Simon Peter, wants to use the sword against the arresting party, Jesus stops that. Jesus says, if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels to my side. If I wanted to stop them arresting me, I could. Jesus has great peace, great serenity, because he is Lord, and this is the Father's plan. It looks like Satan is in charge when believers are beheaded by ISIS, but Jesus is Lord. It looks as if our society has been captured for 70 years in a Babylonian captivity of godless secularism. From the 1950s onwards, all the graphs for Christianity in the British Isles have gone down like a stone falling. Who is on the throne in the United Kingdom? Jesus. Who is on the throne in Western Europe? Jesus. Who is on the throne in the Americas, North and South? Jesus. Jesus is Lord. The church is growing as it has never grown. The church is growing and the church is evangelizing as it has never done before. Oh, there are problems in the global church, but there's life in the global church. Power was not in the hands of the traitor. Power was not in the hands of Satan. There's such irrationality in the hostility of those who came against Jesus. A mindless mob arresting a man who has broken no law and who has done them no wrong. And if you were to ask some of those hundreds or or the thousand who were there to arrest him, who is this man? We don't know what he looks like. We need a traitor to identify him. And why are you arresting him? What has he done? We're a bit vague about the charge. We're not sure what he's done. But he must be a bad man because the high priests want him arrested. It's a farce. A monstrous traitor. But it turns out he's weak. He's weak and he's on the side of weakness. He's in the dark and he's on the side of darkness. In our culture today, there is uh, an ABC attitude. You know what the ABC attitude is? Anything but Christ. Anyone except Jesus. ABC. That's how our culture runs. Watch the careers of Christians in professions or in politics or something like that, And they either have to choose their words with such care that they almost say nothing, or they will be shot down and torn apart for having these dreadful values of the Word of God. Pray for those who are in any kind of public position, because they are targets all the time in a society that will praise anything but Christ. Accept and value and respect anything but Christ. Is it fair? No, it's not fair. 
but it's the way the world is, and it's the way the world was for Jesus. It's the way the world will be until he comes again. But who held all the power? Your mighty Christ. Isn't that reassuring? So a monstrous traitor, and then a monstrous betrayal, the treachery of Judas. You sense the satanic influence as the events of that night unfold, and as the prearranged sign of the kiss is given. It's so cynical. Who was Judas serving at this point? Not his master, Jesus. He was Satan's servant, giving a cynical, empty kiss. In the first century AD, it was not that unusual for a, a rabbi or a master or someone who was a teacher to approach a student and embrace them and maybe kiss them. It was very unusual in that culture for the student to initiate that, to come up first to the master. It, it, there, there, there is a difference between a master and the one who's being taught. There is a difference between a Lord and the one who is learning from the Lord, and yet Judas is so brazen, and he marches up to Jesus, arms open, embraces him, kisses him. And even as he approaches to do it, we know from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 22, that Judas is given one last warning by Jesus. Jesus says, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Are you going to go through with this? Are you going to have this stain on your soul? But he's got the money in his pocket already. He's made his bargain with the devil and the servants of the devil. And emboldened by the mod, by the mob, on goes Judas with his mission to kiss Jesus. What was going on in his heart? I think we don't need to speculate, really. I don't think it's helpful to speculate and think, oh, maybe this, maybe that, but rather to let the Scripture itself interpret what was going on. You could approach it from the Old Testament Psalms and the prophecies that speak about this betrayal, but I think we're on even surer ground by listening to the conversation in John 13, that great passage in the upper room. John 13 is a very important passage in the Word of God, and it gives such insight. John 13 verse 2 says that Satan had prompted Judas to betray the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, as he was washing the disciples' feet and explaining, you are all clean, you, you are all my people, saved through me, this symbolic washing of your feet is just reminding you that you need to keep coming back for cleansing, but fundamentally you've been saved, you've been washed, you've been adopted into the family of God. You are clean, except for one of you. One of you is not clean. One of you is not in me. One of you is not in union with Christ. One of you is not living by faith. One of you is not made new and regenerate by the power of the Holy Spirit. One of you is on the other side. You're all clean, except one of you. The false follower is in the grip of sin. He's in the grip of unbelief. And that's in John 13, and when Judas dipped his hand in the bowl, probably of the bitter herbs, um, to share part of the Passover meal with Jesus, they would have had bread, and they would have been dipping in the bowl, and Jesus' hand and Judas' hand are in the bowl. And this is one of the things Jesus said, the one who dips his hand with me, he's the one who will betray me. There is that moment when it all crystallizes in the heart of Judas Iscariot. He has the Passover bread in his hand, and he has the Passover lamb reclining at the table beside him, but he's not feeding on the Passover lamb. He's not feeding on the living bread. He's not feeding on Christ. Christ doesn't have the taste, have the flavor 
that he wants at all. He rejects Christ. And we read in John 13, 27, that in that moment, Satan entered into him. They're terrifying words. There really was no way back for Judas. He had been offered opportunities for repentance. But he chose his side. Do you think Judas was disappointed in God? I think that's a danger that we face, even as believers, even as Christians, that life can pan out in a, di in a way that's difficult or in a way that's tough. You can get married and the marriage can be difficult. You can have children and things in the family can be difficult. You can have a workplace or a job that you asked for and prayed for and it turns out to be a nightmare. You can get blessings in this world and they turn out to be a temptation or a weight around your neck. Close friends can let you down and the church can break your heart. You know, they talk in the military about friendly fire incidents where people are injured or lives are lost uh, because of a mistake, because ordnance goes astray, or because people target the wrong sector and they end up attacking innocently and without thought, attacking their own troops. Maybe the Air Force attacking the army on the ground. And that's a disaster. But we do something worse in the church sometimes because we know we're doing We're actually, we're turning the guns on someone Jesus died for and we're lining up the crosshairs and we're squeezing the trigger and we know we're doing it. It's not very friendly fire at all. It's very unfriendly fire. It hurts far more when there's a trouble or a dis dis distress that is caused with no sympathy, with no concern, with no love from within the body of Christ. Now Judas, he's different. He's outside the body. He looked like a disciple, but he was never a disciple. Be so careful with what you hear about people, with what you repeat about people. Gossip is wrong, always, even if it's accurate. What is helped by passing on some critical negativity in my role in the Board of Ministry? It's one of the things that distresses me, the way young preachers and less experienced leaders are often given such a terrible roasting by supposedly mature Christians, maybe middle-aged or older Christians. And it's often it's the mature folk who are behaving like babies. This is not how Jesus treated his disciples. Look at the mistakes they made. Simon Peter is going to deny him three times. Is he out? No. Jesus will make a point of dealing with his failure and teaching him through his failure and restoring him to useful service. We are rubbish at that in the church. We need to learn from Jesus how to deal with disappointments, how to deal with difficulties, how to deal with differences of opinion in a way that will be God-honoring and in a way that will build others up. And I know my default position, and I suspect it's the same for you, but I think my default position is to always want to look good, sound good, and have the praise of others. That's not how Jesus went into that night, is it? That's not how he went through the Garden of Gethsemane. That's not how he dealt with Judas. That's not how he dealt with the trial that we'll be thinking about around the Lord's Supper tonight. Jesus is not fixated on his own good name or his own good reputation because God the Father will give that to him. He's fixed instead on doing the will of God. 
So I'm going to ask myself, and I'm going to ask you this morning, a very, very solemn and serious question. I don't think anyone here is going to betray Jesus the way Judas did, but are we in danger of betraying Jesus in the way that Christians can betray Jesus? Just by being cold, or prayerless, or selfish, or touchy, or moody, or greedy, or immature. One of the ways, of course, in this generation in which we are in danger of betraying Jesus is that we walk away from Scripture and its authority, and we say, well, society has changed, and the world has changed, and the church has to move with the times, and the church has to change with the times, and the church has to fit in with the message of the society we're in, and that is rubbish. The gospel is the Word of God. What got Peter into trouble on that night was his pride and, frankly, his stupidity. I've got a sword. I'm going to use it. When did Jesus ever advance his cause with a sword? There's a quote here for you from David Holloway, who's a vicar in Newcastle, a very faithful servant of Christ. David Holloway said, Mohammed rode into Medina to conquer. Christ rode into Jerusalem to die. That's the difference in a nutshell between Islam and Christianity. Peter, put your sword away. Attacking the high priest's servant is not the way God intends that night to work out. Jesus is healing one of his enemies from an injury caused by one of his followers. Peter has a lot to learn. He's still impulsive, foolish, erratic. He means well, but he needs to grow up. I find myself behaving a lot like Peter, and I'm sure you do as well. One thing is crystal clear on that night, and get this. If you don't get very much else out of this sermon, get this. The arrest of Jesus Christ, the betrayal of Jesus, the actions of Judas, and the actions of Jesus, they were all fulfilling God's plan, fulfilling God's word. God's word was being followed and being fulfilled. And you can rely on that word not just in the first century A.D., but in the 21st century A.D., you can rely on God's Word. Scripture had predicted the traitor. Think of Psalm 41, the one who eats bread with me. He has lifted up his heel against me. Think of Psalm 55 or Psalm 69, many, many other parts of Scripture that predicted the suffering and the death of the Messiah. Isaiah 50. Three. Jesus had spoken in his own ministry and prophetically spoken, predicting that the Son of Man would be betrayed, that he would be in the hands of sinners, that he would be handed over to the Gentiles, that he would be flogged, that he would be scourged, that he would be raised on a tree, crucified. It was prophesied. It was promised by God. It was predicted. And now God's plan, his will is being worked out. It is coming to a head. The Son of Man will be betrayed, handed over to the Gentiles, crucified as a sin offering, and not one word of Scripture will be left unfulfilled. But woe to the traitor, woe to the one who monstrously betrays the Lamb of God. Now, a little quote for you. This is from a pastor in London, Richard Cokin, of the Dundonald churches. He's pointed out that later on, when Jesus was on the cross, the sarcastic sign, he says, above the cross read, the King of the Jews. The soldiers thought they'd put out the rubbish. But what had they really done? 
they had enthroned God's king. This age that we are in has contempt for the word of God. Large sections of the church in the Western world have contempt for the plain meaning of the Word of God. But you and I, Scripture must govern us and govern our churches. See that you believe the Word of God and see that you never betray it. Let Scripture govern us at all times. Last week, a friend of mine was attending the global gathering of Anglicans from around the world. He's a Presbyterian, but he was invited as part of the World Reformed Fellowship to be in Jerusalem with about 6,000 others who gathered from all around the world, faithful Christians, confessing Jesus as Lord and confessing the Bible and the faith once delivered to the saints as their faith. There were people there from all over the world, and they spoke of the, the way in which the church in Europe and North America must repent and return to the Bible on issues like Jesus being the only way of salvation, and the Bible being authoritative in all areas of life, including things like marriage, what it is to be human, what God teaches on human sexuality. Rico Tice was at that gathering in Jerusalem. He has recently resigned as uh, a member of a committee uh, set up by the Archbishop of Canterbury, a commission on evangelism. And Rico Tice, the, the founder of Christianity Explored, he has said he cannot be part of the Archbishop's commission because the Archbishop has put in charge of that commission someone who's attacking Christianity from within, someone who's denying the biblical teaching on these very areas where the gospel is under attack today. And I read this a statement from Rico Tice last week. The road, he said, to destruction in Britain is defined by two things tolerance and permissiveness. You can do what you please, and you can think what you please. If we have church leaders who are putting people on that road to destruction, it is a salvation issue. That's why we have to distance ourselves from leadership contrary to Scripture. Scripture governed Jesus. Therefore, he went to the cross, he went to the trial, he went to the grave, and he rose again. Scripture governed Jesus. Scripture governed the apostles. Scripture governed the early church, the Reformation church, and Scripture governs the vast majority of lively churches in the world today. But Scripture is not governing many of the big denominations in Europe and North America, or even here in Scotland. We need to repent. We need to plead with God to return and cleanse and revive our land. And it must mean that the Bible will be in the driving seat. There will be no blessing, no future, if we keep rejecting and pushing away the Word of God. Remember what Jesus said as impulsive Peter got a sword out. I could call on 12 legions of angels. Well, there are 6,000 in a legion. 12 times 6,000, well, that's 72,000 angels. A legion of angels per apostle. Jesus and the 11 could have had 6,000 angels each. Each angel equipped with a better, more deadly sword than Peter had. Jesus didn't want to avoid the cross because it was written. Jesus didn't want to avoid shame because Isaiah 53 said he was despised and rejected of men. He has carried our griefs. He has borne our sorrows. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Scripture governed Jesus. Let Scripture be your governor, as it was the governor for your Savior. 
in love, God sent his Son to face the arresting mob. In love, God sent his Son to face a trial. We'll think about that tonight. And in love, God gave his Son to die for sinners. Respond to that love, not by betraying Jesus with unbelief and choosing the side of his mockers and his enemies. Respond to that love by saying, Lord, change me so that I might follow you and so that I might trust you and so that I might be a servant of your word. Amen. Lord, will you bless us and will you speak to us today? These are wonderful chapters, solemn chapters. May they come alive for us. And as we gather tonight to reflect further on Jesus on the way to the cross, speak to our hearts and bless us and grant us joy and peace and oneness and unity in the truth of the gospel. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.